Hi there everybody! So greetings and welcome to this new set of lectures today. Uh, in this video, I will be talking about one of the translation procedure and I mean one of the theory of translation analysis. So this is by Jean Paul Vinay and Jean Darbelnet. So this is called the Vinay and Darbelnet's model. More specifically, we will be talking about two major two major strategies uh, developed by Vinay and Darbelnets and these two major strategies had um, seven uh, specific procedures in translating. Uh, they also have provided supplementary translation procedures. We'll also be talking about the levels of translation. So there are three levels of translations that they have proposed. So let's get into it. Who are Vinay and Darbelnet, by the way? So in 1950s, these two French scholars, uh, Jean-Paul Vinay and Jean Darbelnet, they explored the linguistic aspect of translation. And during this time, translation studies as a, an academic discipline is not yet established. So during this time, the field of translation was not uh, really developed yet. So what they did is that they carried out a comparative stylistic analysis of the languages French and the English language. So that is their pioneering work. So a comparative stylistic analysis of French and the English language. So most of what they did is actually just considered as a comparative literature. And more specifically, they looked at texts in both languages, the French language and then the English language, they noted differences between the languages and they identified different translation strategies and procedures. And then this work has gained a wide influence and there are lots of adaptations as well of their work such as the in the French and German translation in English and Spanish translation and 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 and, and so on so and even up until today um, this um, model is still relevant and still important in the study of translation so according to Vinay and Darbelnet there are two major strategies in in translation so which are the direct translation and oblique translation and uh, these two has I mean these two have specific procedures which are the borrowing calc literal so it is covered uh, they are covered by the direct translation and then transposition modulation equivalence and adaptation uh, under oblique translation so it is important to note that there is a significant difference between stra a strategy in translation and a procedure because in a strategy this is the overall orientation of a translator towards the text say for instance in our previous uh, topics uh, we have uh, talked about the domestication and foreignization. Foreignization and domestication uh, are examples of a strategy the general or the overall um, orientation of a translator but Procedures, on the other hand, they are the specific technique, the, this, the, that certain method employed by the translator in translating, just like borrowing. In the case of the foreignization and domestication, we have those specific procedures like borrowing, gloss, um, omission. So those are procedures and the general ones are the strategies. So here, according to Vinay and Darbelnet, the strategies in general are the direct and oblique translations and we have seven um, procedures they also have provided supplementary translation procedures which are the amplification false friend loss gain and compensation explicitation and generalization so uh, at this point I would like to take you deeper into each of these um, strategies and those specific uh, procedures so the first strategy they have developed is the direct translation and it covers three specific procedures the borrowing calc and literal so let's have borrowing borrowing so here the source language uh the word uh in the source language is transferred directly to the target language say for example this english th these are now english uh words also but originally they they are russian words rubble dacha glasnost and perestroika uh so those words are borrowed from russian language 
So they are incorporated in the English language to fill a semantic gap in the target language. So you, we usually borrow words or those loan words to fill a semantic gap in the target language. Meaning to say when there is no like exact uh, equivalent of this item in the target language. So what the translators would 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 do is that we usually just borrow those words directly to the target language and they add a local color. So say for example these words right here, the soshi, kimono, oshogatsu, of course they are Japanese words but they are also uh, incorporated in the English language. They're borrowed also from the Jap from the Nihongo language. They added a local color. This kind of an, an exotic flavor of the language. And uh, when we when we when when we for example when we're reading the text we we have an idea, we have a hint that what we're actually reading is some uh, translated version of some original text. So Sometimes it entails an additional need for transcription. We also have calc, so a calc translation. Uh, this is a special kind of borrowing. Uh, the, the source language expression or structure is transferred in a literal translation. I have here uh, an example. For example, the German beer garden word, uh, this is borrowed in a special way in the English language. So this is beer garden in English language. So that is an example of a calc. More examples, in the French language we have the word pomediadam. Uh, that is, in, in the English language that's Adam's apple. So accordingly that is an example of a calc. So, okay, so lastly in direct translation we have literal translation. Of course this is a word for word translation. So m this is most common used uh, between languages of the same family and culture so when the structures of both languages the the source language and the target language if they have they exhibit somehow the same linguistic structure then that is when uh, most oftentimes literal kind of translation is possible so say for example between English and French uh, they exhibited somehow uh, similar structure like this this sentence for example i left my spectacles on the table downstairs so if you try to take a look at the the corresponding structure of the english tra of the french translation i mean so this is almost the same so again literal translation is possible when both languages uh, come from the same family and culture how um, so according to Vinay and Darbelnet, so literal translation is prescribed as good translation. So they recommended it. They said that literalness should only be sacrificed because of structural and metalinguistic requirements, and only after checking that the meaning is fully reserved. So what? Uh, again, we only sacrifice the literalness of our trans uh, of our translation uh, when we encounter structural and metalinguistic and. Uh, requirements or structural and metalinguistic constraints but if as much as possible we have to like try to make it as literal as possible according to Vinay and Darbelnet. However it is not all the time obviously that we can employ literal translation because of course a lot of languages uh, they they do not have the same culture or linguistic uh, structure and and and, and cultural uh, values so what if a literal translation is impossible that is now the time that we need to resort to another strategy which is now the oblique translation so according to Vinay and Darbelnet uh, we need to resort to oblique translation when uh, literal translation is impossible so it is uh, comprised of four different procedures the transposition modulation equivalence and adaptation so i'd like to take you more into each of these uh, specific procedures we uh, let's let's have transposition so this is a change of one part of speech for another for example from noun 
to a verb so without changing the sense of so it's probably the most common structural change undertaken by translators according to Vinay and Darbonnet. So for example here the word they have pioneered. So the pioneered word here uh, functions as a verb but in the translation they have been the first. So the pioneered was replaced by a noun. So been the first. So the first here is already a noun uh, that replaced the verb in the or in the original text or in the uh, st. So the adverb um, trans uh, trans. I uh, mean no no no. So uh, an adverb here uh, became a verb in the target language. For example, he he will soon be back. So soon that is that is an adverb, but in the case of the target language or in the translated text, it became a verb. So he will hurry. So hurry to be back. That's a verb. Next, um, we have modulation. So modulation. So this changes the semantics uh, and point of view of the source language. So for say for example, the 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 line, the time when, or the phrase, the time when, this is translated in French language as le moment, le moment, le momento. Uh, in literal sense, that means the moment where. So here, the semantics and the point of view is somehow tweaked. So it changed the semantics and the point of view of the source language. So that's modulation from the word modulated. So according to Vinay and Darbelnet, uh, uh, modulation is subdivided into these um, uh, subcategories. So we have the abstract and concrete or particular and general. So say for example, she can do no other. Uh, we can modulate it into something like she cannot act differently. So from abstract down to the concrete one or from a particular uh, down to the general. So for example, the general from particular to general, give a pint of blood. That's a particular one, particular... Um, yeah, more specific, but the general um, translation give a little blood. Okay, so we also have another category, explicative modulation or effect and cause. So here, for example, you're quite a stranger. Uh, in the target text, uh, it becomes we don't see you anymore. We don't see you anymore. You're quite a stranger. We don't see you anymore. So all the nuances of meaning were retained but it's very obvious that it's kind of modulated so that's an explicative modulation or effect and cause whole and part so for example he shut the door in my face uh he shut the door in my nose so marashag sinek duki no so whole and part so that's another form of modulation under oblique translation so moreover we also have part and another part for example he cleared his throat to he cleared his voice so throat replaced by voice so a part is also uh, replaced by another part again that's a form of modulation reversal of terms you can have it to I'll give it to you so the item in the source language was reversed but the nuances of meaning uh, is still the same negation of opposite so for example it does not seem unusual and in the target text it is very normal is it does not seem unusual and it's very normal so somehow the same but yeah there's a process of modulation active to passive we are not allowed to access uh, the internet we're not allowed to access the the internet to they don't allow us to access the internet rethinking of intervals and limits in space and time for example no parking between signs to limit of parking so and lastly we have the change of symbol so it it, it includes fixed and new metaphors in the French language, we have la motarde le mon montaones. I don't know how to read that though. Uh, in in English, that means the mustard rose up to his nose. But in English, it is um, translated as he saw red. Oh, he became very angry. So the symbol here was changed from rose to uh, red. 
mustard rose to red. Okay. Now we're down to the second type of oblique translation. We have the equivalence. So equivalence, um, cases where languages describe the same situation by different stylistic or structural means. So particularly useful in translating idioms and or idioms and proverbs. So for example, uh, this idiomatic expression in the uh, French language, we have commionche and dance on jeudi, blah, blah, blah. In literal sense, in the English language, that means uh, like a dog in a game of skittles. Uh, but that is um, by following the idiomatic convention and proverb convention maybe in the English language that is translated to like a bull in a china shop. By the way, all of these examples are taken from the work of Vinay and Darbelnet. So this is an example of an equivalence, a case, again, a case where languages describe the same situation by different stylistic or structural means. So it's very obvious, in, for instance, in this example, the dog uh, becomes a bull in the target text. So different style and different structure, equivalence. We also have adaptation. Adaptation, it involves changing the cultural reference when a situation in the source culture does not exist in the target culture. So, uh, we're, down, we're now down to the supplementary translation procedure. So, according to Vinay and Darbelnet, we have the specific procedures, amplification, false friend, loss gain, compensation, explicitation, and generalization. So, let's get into it one by one. I mean amplification. So here the target language uses more words often because of syntactic expansion. Expansion, I mean, for example, the charge against him to the charge brought against him. So the opposite of amplification is economy. We also have false friend as another procedure. Uh, this uh, structurally similar term in the source language and the target language which deceives the user into thinking the meaning is the same. So for example, the French library means not English library but bookstore. Ah, okay. So we have to be very careful in, in, um, in what do you call this in we need to take heed of this uh, form of translation false friend because it might deceive us into thinking uh, of that particular nuance of meaning but uh, truth be told that is not what we are thinking so false friend plus take char lang uh, so we have lost gain and compensation uh, so lost in translation has become a popular cliche partly thanks to uh, partly thanks to the film so that is a film uh, maybe morag si si Scarlett Johnson ang nagkonana ang nagbida lost in translation anyways translation does inevitably involve some loss since it is impossible to preserve all the ST nuances of meaning and structure in the target language yes of course uh, that's inevitable however importantly at target text may make up for compensate or uh, make may make up or compensate this by introducing a gain at the same time or another point in the text so explicitation so explicitation implicit information in the source text is rendered explicit in this target text so this may occur on the level of grammar for example the english uh, st the doctor explicated as masculine or feminine in a target language where indication of gender is essential semantics for example the explanation of an of a nasty cultural item or event such as u.s thanksgiving or uk april fool's joke pragmatics the opaque and culturally located u.s english idiom it's easy to be a monday morning quarterback or discourse so here again uh, the implicit information in the source text is rendered explicit in the tt just like thanksgiving in the u.s and becomes uh, an April Fool's joke or joke in the UK. 
Next, we have generalization as another supplementary pr uh, procedure in translating. The use of a more general word in the target text. So, examples would be uh, source text computer to TT machine or the source text ecstatic to TT happy. Again, generalization has been suggested as another characteristic of translation. Now we're down to the three levels of translation by Binet and Darbilnet. And this is comprised of the lexicon, syntactic structure, and message. So according to Binet and Darbilnet, so all of those seven uh, major um, procedures in translation, the borrowing, calc, literal translation, transposition, modulation, equivalence, and adaptation, they all operate on three different levels of translation. The first level, lexicon second syntactic structure and then the message so of course lexicon when we say lexicon that is on the word level syntactic structure the maybe the positioning of words within the sentence the arrangement of words okay and then the message as a whole so that includes now the discourse level the metalinguistic uh, situation or uh, basically the context so that is now considered in this level so again lexicon syntactic structure and message so these are the three levels within which all of those seven procedures operate according to Vinay and Darbelnet there are also other um, what do you call this um, Procedures, or they have further introduced these terms, word order and thematic structure and connectors. So, um, okay, so connectors, uh, this refers to the cohesive links. So like also and, but, nor, for, uh, parallelism, parallel structures. Discourse markers, however, first, they exist, like pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, she, it, this, and that, and also punctuation marks. So, I think that's the end of my presentation today. So, in, uh, in this report, we have talked about the two general strategies developed by Vinay and Darbelnet in translation, the direct translation, and the other one is the the oblique translation and we also have talked about the seven specific procedures and the three levels of translation thank you so much for your time watching this video and i hope uh you you find this substantial and useful god bless